Hi, this is Charlie Peck of Advancing Humanity. We have Larry here. He's a former DEA agent, and now he runs his own investigation business. And I can't wait to speak with you. We have so many important topics. Welcome to the show, Larry. Uh, thank you, uh, Charlie. And I appreciate uh, you asking me to participate in your show today. Well, it's so important because as we started our conversation off before we started recording, we talked about violent crime and how so much of it links back to drugs. And I'm wondering if you can just start there and expand a little bit upon our drug problem in America. Well, as, as time has gone on, I, I don't think our drug problem has gotten any better. I think it's gotten worse. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, I mean, what's transpiring, what has happened over the years. I mean, for someone who comes from a law enforcement background uh, and dealing with this probably 40 years ago and seeing where it is today, um, you can see um, the differences. And uh, violence has always been that part of the business. Um, I kind of sometimes uh, look and hear sometimes politicians say that there's non-violent drug traffickers. Uh, there may be some uh, on the lower end of the schedule, let's say, but the or the drug organizations uh, that DEA investigates um, are well known violent, like the cartels from Mexico, Colombia, and even a lot of uh, street gangs here in the United States. They're violent. There's no question about it. And I can go way back to the heroin traffickers back in Baltimore, uh, where I used to work and spent a lot of my time there in law enforcement. And I can tell you from firsthand that the heroin traffickers in the city of Baltimore were very violent and still continue to be violent today. Mm. Is the media getting it right as far as the shows they're putting out there? I mean, we had Breaking Bad, we have, which is a great show, and Narcos, is, of course, is so prevalent in our society now, that kind, yeah. of, that kind of media, that, those kind of shows. Are they getting it right? Is it really that gruesome? Well, Narcos certainly is, um, because Narcos is really uh, about the two DEA agents who were in uh, Colombia, mm -hmm. uh, Murphy and Javier Pena, and uh, there's also some episodes about Mexico, uh, which showed uh, the kidnapping and torture of uh, Ricky, Kiki Camarena right. back in the 80s. So yeah, I, I think... Uh, they're, those shows are pretty much spot on. And, and of course, there is some drama even in uh, the Netflix series too. So, and it's all about, uh, I guess, I don't want to say glamorizing drug traffickers, but in one sense it does. Um, and so I always, when I watch, I just sit back and just shake my head and, and say, this is Hollywood at its best. Hmm, right. Well, in you know, shows like I'm watching Better Call Saul right now, and it shows how once you're kind of in it, you can't get out of it. Is that true at all? Or is, is that truly a problem? Well, that is a problem. And uh, I guess once you're in the game, you never get out of the game. And usually what happens in that game, you're either murdered or you're caught by law enforcement. And so that's the risk associated in, in that game, so to speak. Um, I think uh, most of them don't fear law enforcement as they fear their competitors. Because at the end of the day, they know there's a deadly issue behind it. And so when you cross that threshold, that's when it becomes very, very dangerous for drug traffickers. Yeah, so my concern then is how can people avoid this? I mean, I'm sure there are some demographics uh, of people who get in the game, so it's called. And who are those people who are getting involved? Well, I, I guess it, it arranged from a variety of people, from every ethnic, racial background you can imagine. Hmm. I've arrested, and I can honestly tell you this, every different nationality that this world has to offer that are involved in drug trafficking. It's not a local problem. It is a worldwide problem. It's a pandemic. Just mm -hmm. like what we're going through, it is certainly a pandemic, pandemic excuse me, that's in the drug world. Um, and so when you begin to see not only the volume that comes into this country, but the purity 
behind it. Back in the, in the 70s and 80s, heroin purity was down around 6 7%. Today, it's over 90% pure. So you can see how deadly it is. And so when you say pure, can you please explain the importance of that? Why is it significant for it to be pure? Well, they add a lot less adulterants. For example, like heroin, they're cut with a, a variety of different products. Um, and so what they did was when the Colombian traffickers got involved on the heroin side, because traditionally they moved a lot of cocaine through this country. So they started using the same traditional routes that they moved cocaine through, and now they started shipping heroin. And so Colombia tried to take over from what the Southeast, Southeast Asian heroin came through the United States. So now you can see the difference in the purity. Um, so what basically happened is now that you're seeing there's a deadly mixture of fentanyl that's being mixed in with heroin and now even cocaine. And so fentanyl obviously comes from China. Um, and so there's a lot of um, issues that come with that. So and, and a lot of times the Chinese traffickers work with the Mexican traffickers and it's able to come through uh, the southern border of the United States. So those are all the issues that go on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you explain to somebody who's poor, who doesn't have money, that somebody comes to them and say, listen, I want you to be a lookout. I'll give you $1,000 an hour. I'll give you $500 an hour. Or I want you to be a stash house for me. And I'll pay you X number of dollars just to be a stash house. And again, I'm not just saying any segment of society, but what usually happens and what I've seen in my career, a lot of time uh, what happens is a lot of these single moms that are out there who have children, they'll be offered by the drug traffickers uh, money to store weapons or drugs for them. This is done on, this was done on a regular basis. I know it probably still continues today. And I've interviewed and arrested some of those moms uh, who got themselves, unfortunately, uh, I would say they were betrayed in one sense, but they became a willing participant on the other. And so traditionally, what these drug traffickers do, they'll go and do their own recruit, recruiting. They'll either have them become mules um, or stash houses. So there's a variety of people that are involved. So you can look from the poorest neighborhoods to the upper middle class neighborhoods. It's just depending on who, on what organization and who's involved. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like if somebody's approached, like one of those single mothers, if they're approached and asked at that point, I mean, it's almost impossible to say no, I would think. You probably don't even have the opportunity to say no, do you? Uh, I don't think you have much of a choice. But again, you know, what do you do? Do you go ahead and sign your soul over to them? Um, or do you try to get away and try to go find somewhere else to live? Now, that's a difficult situation for anybody to be put in. So, again, um, I've seen it, I've lived it, and I know what happens to individuals who get caught up in this, in this drug trade and, then, and what has been taking place for such a long time. And so many people are affected by this, uh, by this ominous drug that drugs or drugs that have been causing the issues in this country that's been going on for the last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Can you tell of a case that kind of got to a really bad point that you're thinking about when you mentioned that? Well, there's, there's quite a few cases. Um, I do know, um, even back in, in, uh, in, in Baltimore where, um, and if you've ever watched the wire, um, which was an HBO series. Mm -hmm. There's some DEA cases on there that worked with the, um, the Baltimore city homicide unit. And I happened to work cases with them on some of the violent drug traffickers in, in Baltimore. Um, we had an individual who had a car wash in uh, an area called West Baltimore. Uh, West Baltimore is still violent by today's standards. Um, this, person became sort of the quote unquote pillar of the community uh, because he gave out a lot of cash 
to some of the citizens in that community. So what we were able to do was dismantle his organization, which was tied all the way into uh, a group of Israelis out of Brazil. And so you could see the magnitude of the, uh, of the expansion of the drug trade. So it's just not limited, limited to, to Baltimore. But what usually happens is they look for a variety of sources, whether it's coming from New York, uh, whether it's coming from any other overseas location. Um, so in, uh, in the uh, episode of uh, The Wire, and what I know, uh, because these individuals uh, killed a security guard at a local grocery store because he actually stopped them and questioned them thinking that they were shoplifting. Uh, we even heard um, them plotting to kill other conspirators in this case. So uh, the person who was involved behind this obviously got life uh, without parole and some of the other drug traffickers that we arrested. Uh, some of the drug traffickers in that particular case were former um, Israeli military people that uh, we even had a, uh, I should say, a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with a couple of them when uh, we did some raids, unbeknownst to us at the time. So it involves a whole segment of people that, are, that make this drug trade, um, I'll say, successful, successful as it has been because of the billions and billions of dollars that they've made, all the way from Pablo Escobar to El Chapo and to all these you know, big time major uh, narco traffickers. Wow. Yeah. My, I mean, it's well beyond something I would even think about on a normal basis. And I'm just wondering, like, how do we deal with this? How, is immigration really something we should look more to, like to, to regulating that? Would that be helpful? Or what do we do about that? Well, I, I could tell you this for sure. We need secure borders. Okay. No matter what your political persuasion is. OK, mm -hmm. I happen to work investigations down on the southwest border, uh, particularly around California and out in uh, Arizona. Um, so I do know from firsthand of what transpires to those borders. And I know that the Border Patrol, who've been putting themselves in harm way for a long, long time, um, are, real, are the real heroes on the border because of the dangers that they face every day not only from the drug trade, but the illegal immigration that takes place. And so we have to protect our borders. And the reality is we never have protected our borders like the way they should be. Um, so when you get a constant flow of drugs coming from uh, Mexico and other countries, that tells me one thing, that there is a continuum flow of drugs, you know, who's involved in it, and you can even see that the Mexican traffickers used tunnels. El Chapo was famous for using tunnels. Yeah. DEA has a task force out in San Diego, California, that deals strictly with tunnels coming across the United States. So again, we need secure borders to protect the citizens of this country. Where else should we be concerned about now? Like what other borders should we be watching out for? Well, our northern border with Canada has always been suspect um, because the traffickers know that they have to have alternative ways, alternative routes to move their shipments. Yeah. Because you have, you know, when we got, and when you begin to look at all the major ports that we have in this country, I mean, it's just mind boggling. Um, I boarded a ship uh, in Baltimore with uh, a group of agents and other law enforcement agencies. And it's like looking for a needle in a haystack when you're trying to find the drugs on those ships. They can hide them anywhere. So, um, you know, the one way we were successful was because we had uh, inside information, you know, the use of informants or wiretaps or whatever that helped us to detect uh, those drugs in, in, on those ships. It's very challenging. You know, the Coast Guard does a great job every day that they're out there seizing uh, major shipments 
Uh, so there's a variety of, of uh, law enforcement agencies that have to work together, whether it's here or internationally, to combat the problem. Now you begin to say, well, you know, why are all these drugs come here? Well, we have a demand for them. And so we have to educate that demand. And it all starts with our children, educating the children, getting them from the very beginning and, and trying to uh, have them learn the difficulties they will face once they become a drug addict. And I think this has been going on the D.A.R.E. program and, and a lot of programs. Uh, I did uh, some classroom stuff for kids in the elementary all the way up to the high school level. And I was always a proponent of doing it at the elementary level because a lot of times, by the time it gets to high school, there's kids already using drugs. Yeah. Yeah, I teach high school, so I, I can confirm that as well. But that's, they have access to it way earlier. Yeah. Um, what uh, lengths do people go to to actually smuggle these drugs into the country? Oh, I mean, if you can think of something, they come up with it. Uh, even back in the, I'd say early 80s, maybe the mid 80s, the Colombians started using one man submarines. So, oh boy. in smuggling uh, drugs. Um, and you'll, recently, I think the Coast Guard just came up with one that they were actually able to show it live with the person operating the submarine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, vehicles are another means of transportation, whether they're tractor trailers or cars. And, uh, and we go back to the borders again, because a lot of it comes through Mexico. Cars, uh, tractor trailers, you name it, they get it across. Mules, when they come across the southern border. And the drug traffickers aren't stupid. They're very smart, because they'll actually set up a vehicle so that the authorities will focus on that vehicle with the drugs and then they'll send their other vehicles through. So they, they test our system. They test our system all the time. It's the same thing with terrorists. They test our system. Mm -hmm. And uh, narcotics has a lot to do with funding terrorists. But back to the, on the drug trafficking side is, is that they will take whatever risk they feel is necessary to make money because they got money going. They got, they got the drugs going out and they want the money coming back. And that's kind of the way it works. Yeah. And I, the, the whole question here is how do we stop this? Is it possible to stop this? Is that truly a possibility? I don't think we can stop it in the terms of that it's done over with. Um, and, and here's the other issue. We have our own homemade drugs here in the United States. Methamphetamine, you can make it very simple. Um, and of course, the Mexicans supply a lot of the methamphetamine to come to this country. But it can be made and has been made in the United States. So there, there's a lot of big issues here, not just from overseas, but right here in a good old U.S. of A. And so, you know, there, there, it, I don't, like I said, as long as there's a demand, they will find a way to get those drugs to those individuals that want to use them. Again, I harp on education. I think it's, it's very um, effective, I think, in one sense of educating our kids. We got to do it while they're young. And a lot of times, you know, teachers uh, always face that issue because, some of these kids don't come from the very nice homes that a lot of people do. And some of these kids, you know, their best meal is at school. And uh, so when you begin to look at the big picture, you have to look at everything from the demand to reducing the demand and the education. Uh, and of course, we have to continue to keep enforcement at hand. Now, there are even some proponents out there, even uh, some guys that I used to work with in law enforcement that are there for legalization of drugs. And I'm not just talking about marijuana. I'm talking about heroin, cocaine, et cetera, because they think that that will solve the problem 
in relationship to violence. And I don't think that's the right message. And, uh, but, you know, that's just their message. What is the right message then, according to I, you? I, I, well, I think the right message is um, education and enforcement, treatment. Those are the messages that we have to use. Um, we look differently now in terms of treatment that we did 30 years ago. It's a total different ball game. Um, I don't prescribe to, uh, to methadone. Uh, I just think that creates more issues. But there are other drugs out there that are probably more, effect more effective. Uh, they're using Suboxone a lot or Subutex to treat, um, you know, uh, people who have addictions. Um, but you have to monitor behavior when you're dealing with people who have those type of issues. Um, I've met uh, medical directors of clinics, uh, interview them on other issues and other matters. Uh, and really, their heart is in the right place. Now, some of them go off to the wrong place, but I would say the majority of them are in the right place. And yes, we have to treat people. We have to look at this as a medical issue. Um, and so there, there's, there's a whole gamut of things that, that you have to look at. Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like you put a lot of people in jail for their use of drugs, the drug trafficking. How many of those people do you think should have gone into treatment instead of jail? Well, let me back you up. We, I've never put anybody in jail for use of drugs. These are drug traffickers. Just traffic, well, trafficking. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fair. That's fair. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay. And that misinformation is about putting users in prison. We don't put users in federal prison. We put major drug traffickers in federal prison, and that's where they belong. Users typically get involved in a multitude of crimes, and that's usually on a local and state level. And those users are the ones that usually will break into your house, steal things. Um, I don't know of anybody, and even by today's standards, that's gotten put in jail for possession of marijuana or any other type of drug that's taking place right now. There's always some uh, connection or nexus between the drug user and the crime that they committed. Um, and so those people uh, need to be treated. Um, but again, I think one of the effective things that I, that I look at are the drug courts. You go in a drug court, for example, you're a user, you broke into houses, and they put you in a treatment program. And they try to get you to change your behavior. Now, here's the key. You have to want to change your behavior. Right. Without your will, there's no rehabilitation. Hmm. You can't rehabilitate major drug traffickers because they're not users. Okay? They're facilitators. Okay. And they're there for one thing. It's all about money. That's what they're about. They're here to make money. They could care less if the children in the elementary schools or high schools are using drugs. It's not about that. For them, it's about money. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me back to thinking about informers or informants. Sorry. Um, does an informant, like what is their motivation? How, how do you capture someone to become an informant? Is it someone you've arrested and you give them a better deal? Or how does that work? Well, there, there's a variety of ways that it works, but yes, one of the uh, ways that law enforcement uses that as a quote unquote as a tool is to arrest somebody and to get them to cooperate against the people that are supplying the drugs. Um, however, um, we do that in a very cautious way because informants um, are still part of the criminal element. And so you have to do things independently to cooperate what they're telling you. So in other words, if you said, hey, Larry, you know, this guy, he's a big time drug dealer and he's moving hundreds of kilos of cocaine. And how do you know? Well, I saw it. So how do I believe you that you saw it? So we have to independently cooperate what you said. Um, so there's a variety of tactics that are used by law enforcement to cooperate with that informant said. 
I've taught law enforcement about informants, and I gave them three rules about informants. The first rule is never trust them. The second rule is never trust them. Mm-hmm. And the third rule is never trust them. Mm-hmm. Cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. And because you're dealing with people, again, that are part of the criminal element. Drug addicts, for example, I never use them. I try to stay away from them because the problem utilizing drug people with, uh, as an informant, they're going to, they're, what they're going to do is they're going to, what we call, take a pinch, take a pinch for themselves. And the next thing you know, it's up their nose. So you have to be very careful on who you use as an informant. Now, as I always said, in, informants are a necessary evil because you can't use Mother Teresa to capture these drug traffickers. Just doesn't work that way. Law enforcement would never be successful without the effective use of informants. Mm -hmm. Do you have a case of where an informant brought Mm -hmm. down somebody really big that was an essential piece of the investigation you were doing? Oh, yes. Quite a few of them. Okay. Usually, it's like um, getting insider trade information. So let's say, for example, you know, I had $1,000 and I wanted to get this, you know, invest in this particular uh, item. And the next thing you know, I hit for $100,000. That's insider trade information. It is, you need it in drug organizations because the drug traffickers aren't going to go knocking on law enforcement's door and says, hey, I'm moving 1,000 kilos a week. So you have to get the people that are involved who have the necessary intelligence and information on the operation of the organization. So what we do is we look at from the top down, but we sometimes we got to work from the bottom on the way up. And so what we're able to do is I have dismantled organizations, starting with their transportation, money laundering, their distributors, middlemen, and all the way to uh, some of the uh, quote unquote executives. So we talked about then all how drugs underlie so many violent crimes and the trafficking piece is huge, obviously, because that is a major societal issue leading to these crimes. What other crimes occur usually because of drugs? Like what other ones show up? Well, the other ones that I mentioned to you, uh, for example, uh, when you have people addicted to drugs, so they look for a place where they can support their habit. And how do they support their habit? They break into your house, okay? They steal things from you. And that's how they support their habit. So you look at different types of crimes, whether it's burglary, armed robbery or robberies, uh, fraudulent activities. So there's a host of crimes that are associated with drug trafficking. From the user perspective that goes out and does these other type of crimes till the major drug traffickers on what they do. So there is a lot of different crimes associated with drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. And what about homicides? Well, homicides, uh, I think that goes without saying. Uh, A lot of them are related to the drug trade. Uh, When you have criminal gangs, um, with all the killings that are going on every day in this country. I mean, I saw it firsthand. I mean, I worked in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. I saw it firsthand. Mm-hmm. So I know what took place and what took place every, every day in this country. And anybody in law enforcement knows that. They see it every day, day in, day out. Um, so I deal with it from a realistic standpoint, not from any. Uh, misleading information coming from the news media or politicians or whoever. Uh, The one thing that I can say for the most part is that law enforcement, at least when I came through, uh, was politically neutral because we did our job and it didn't matter who got caught up in it. Um, So, and, and that's traditionally the way things have been, at least what I saw, you know, working through the Department of Justice, 
uh, through uh, the U.S. attorneys, the prosecutors, um, and the federal judges. I mean, so we ha- there there is a different uh, mindset now. Back when I started, as opposed to it is today, because today everything is political versus everybody just going and doing their job. And that was the Department of Justice that I worked for. A lot of respect. I knew there was integrity there. And if there were bad people there in the Department of Justice, DEA, FBI, they got prosecuted and they went to federal prison, period. Mm -hmm. So there is some corruption going on, but you're saying that that is not supported. (laughs) For the most part, you go after those people just as much. Absolutely. Not even. There's there's no, let me just say this much to you. Yeah. There's no room for crooks in law enforcement, period. None. Whatever they did, and of course it always gives uh, law enforcement a black eye when they do these things, but it's no different than any other profession. I've arrested teachers who sold drugs. Um, I've arrested dentists, doctors, lawyers, other police officers, law enf- So it, it comes down to me, the way I look at it, is individuals who do bad things. And the individuals who do bad things or group of individuals that do bad things have to be punished. No if, ands, or buts about it. Mm-hmm. When we were, when I've done, and I put police officers in federal prison, whether they were leaking information out to traffickers um, and uh, intercepting them on wires, giving information to the quote unquote bad guys, there's no room for it. I don't care, like I said, it doesn't matter what level you work. There's corruption in every institution. Wow. And what was that like for you to do that though? Um, it wasn't comfortable at first. Uh, but uh, I learned to accept it is that we're going after bad people in uniform or bad people that have a badge in their pocket. That's what that was all about. As I can say, about 99% of everybody that I came in contact with that were in law enforcement, whether it was on a local, state, or federal level, uh, were honest. And I still believe that today. There is an element that's a small percentage. But again, I'm in supporting of punish them, punishing them for their misdeeds. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> it's good to know as a citizen of the United States of America that that's the feeling behind it. I would imagine most people in your position feel that way as well. Yeah, I, I, 100%. I, everybody that I know who um, swore to defend the Constitution of this country feel the same way. Um, There is, again, like I said, there's always that small rogue element, but uh, they should meet the end of justice just like any other citizen who commits a crime. Mm -hmm. And speaking about homicide, I know that you did a lot of work with the Dakota James case, and I'm not really sure what the connection is, uh, but I know you were hired to coordinate that. Can you tell what your role is or was? Well, that that role um, was a missing persons case. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dakota James was obviously a young man. Uh, he was uh, attending a master's, attempting to gain a master's degree at a Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um, he came up missing, um, and I got involved. The family was actually from Maryland, in an area where I actually used to live when I was with the Maryland State Police, and so. Uh, I was contacted by one of my former colleagues uh, and told me about this particular issue that took place. Uh, I was subsequently hired uh, through a friend of the family. And then we went there to assist the family in trying to find this young man. Um, Unfortunately, um, it's still a mystery by today's standards. Um, I was in contact with a group of uh, former NYPD homicide detectives who established a profile back probably in the late seventies called the smiley face killers. And that's how I became involved in the case. And so there was always some dispute on how the young man got in the water. Um, So 
Um, we don't know how he got in the water. There's no evidence. And you probably saw all this. If you saw the docu series and oxygen network where I was on, uh, there's no evidence to say how this young man got in that water. There are suspicious circumstances and there was a dispute between um, a former medical examiner and the current medical examiner uh, and how this ligatures got around his neck. Right. And so um, unfortunately, the case got closed. I mean, it, it was a very um, heart-wrenching case and uh, haven't been around as long as I have. This one to this day still bothers me. I tried not to let too many of these, because I do a lot of private stuff now. And I do, unfortunately, uh, have to meet with families in the sense that they're, you know, in a world of hurt. And uh, it, it's tough sitting there and watching the agony of losing a child. Uh, and, uh, you know, I pray every day that that doesn't happen to me. And, I, I, you know, and you, you don't know until you walk in other people's shoes what that means. And uh, the the Coda's family was uh, was uh, very eager to resolve this issue. They still have the fight of this issue. I don't think they'll ever give up on trying to find out what actually happened to this young man. Um, so that's the unfortunate part about it. And so um, you know maybe one day something will come about that somebody will say something. Well, we never know, but you just don't know. Well, let me ask you this, and I don't mean to be insensitive at all when I ask this question, but it's a true curiosity. Should they give up and, and get some closure and instead of continuously fighting to find out what something well, they not ever know? You know, that's, that's for the individual family to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, if it was me, I would fight until the day that I got buried myself. Yeah, I think I would too. And I think when you look at it, most families would do the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I have some other cases that, that, that are dealing with families and there, there's some other issues that go along with this and losing a child, you know, it's never really easy to accept. Um, so, you know, you believe in things, you believe what happened. And as I looked at that case, Nobody knows their child like their own family. Nobody. Um, yeah, the child could have some issues that you may not know about, but I think for the most part, uh, the close-knit families, and this was a very close-knit family in the Dakota James case, knew exactly what happened. Knew in, in sense of when he was missing because it's just like me. I stay in touch with my daughter every single day. And if God forbid, if something would happen, I would get suspicious right away. And you don't have to have over 30 years of law enforcement to know that. So it all depends on the set of circumstances that's evolving in, in that particular case. And were there, was there some evidence of the smiley face killer being in that area? I, I read about that, but I don't know how substantial that is. Well, they're, they're, according to uh, the retired NYPD homicide investigators, they suspected that they were. Now, the term smiley face killer had to do with the smiley face being made near or where the crime may have been committed. Um, and so uh, there's always been disputes about if there's actually smiley face killers even exist. Um, it's never been determined that they're an organized group. So in, in that sense, you know, is it an individual people that hate people because of their particular background or their behavior? Um, you, you just don't know. Yeah. And so that's why uh, the homicide detectives out of New York established a profile uh, and tried to fit that profile as to what happened to each of the victims in their cases. The reason why Dakota James got picked so is because it was the most recent case of this taking place. There were other cases that happened over a number of years that were historical. 
So they were trying to find a case that was the most recent. And so Dakota Jane's case was the most recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting. And there are so many of those cases that go, that just go, they're not solved. And it's got to be so devastating for families. What is that like for you as an investigator, seeing this throughout your whole 30, 40 years of work? Well, it's, uh, it's tough. And, um, you know, you sit there, you're a human being, and you uh, want to cry with the family uh, on what they're going through. You really do. Um, I know just from human nature, um, it, it really affects you in, in one sense of watching the pain and anguish of a missing child or an unsolved death of a missing child. You know, even when uh, a car accident happens, you basically know kind of what happened. And uh, I would have to go knock on families' doors and tell them that they lost their child in a car accident when I was with the Maryland State Police. Um, and none of that is easy. Uh, and you try to, you know, be as, uh, as uh, respectful as you possibly can and then uh, you have to walk away. And, uh, and sometimes that affects a lot of people in law enforcement. Um, so a lot of different things, you know, again, we're not robots, we're all human beings, okay. families, kids, you name it. So those kind of things can take a toll on you after a while, um, especially if you, if you start saying things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be tough. What do you say to people who suspect that their kid or their family member, their loved one is getting involved in some kind of crime? If they suspect that, what should they do and what shouldn't they do? Well, I, I think um, what they should do is um, watch their behavior of their child. They know when things start changing. Um, so, the problem is, is that kids have a hard time listening to their parents, mm -hmm. as a lot of us parents know. Um, and sometimes they may listen to outside of that home. And that's where teachers come in. Because sometimes you may develop a better relationship with that child on that level than some of the parents do. And so you try to get them help. You try to talk to them. Um, you know, even if a family has um, a strong religious belief, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, or, or whatever, maybe you can get somebody from the clergy to try to talk to them. There, there's a variety of ways. Um, and peer pressure, obviously, is, uh, you know, one of the most challenging things that the parents have to go through because, you know, if your kids hang around with kids that are causing problems, uh, there's a good chance that that your child is going to become involved with the same problems. And I, I'm a firm believer it all comes from the home. There's no question in my mind. Uh, but there are cases where kids have decided to go on a different path. And I know you're a parent. What length should you go to to keep your kid out of that trouble? Well, you have to know who their friends are. That's, do, you, do you keep them away from the friends? Do you absolutely say you cannot hang out with them? And if, I have, if you have to, yes, absolutely. Okay. You have to. If you don't show some discipline and, and give that kid an impression that it's okay to hang around with Joe so-and-so, then that's, that problem is only going to fester itself. Mm -hmm. Tough love has to be implemented in that case. Yeah. No question about it. Well, but you see the outcome. I mean, you see that firsthand, so you know what it can get to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what is your work that you're involved in now? Because I know you're doing something really interesting to help humanity as well now. Well, I, I, do, um, I do a lot of uh, different types of investigations now on the private investigation side. Uh, whether uh, 
I do a lot of work with uh, lawyers on the criminal defense side. A lot of them uh, were um, sexual assault cases. I even was involved in a homicide case not long, well, a few years back. Um, I also work with uh, families who may have some issues with law enforcement, uh, try to work and get those things worked out between them and maybe to get the law enforcement look at it maybe from a different perspective on a particular case that they may have closed. Uh, so I, again, um, so I do a variety of things from even uh, some child custody type cases, which uh, honestly, they're, they're, uh, they're very challenging because- what's, doing, what's the biggest challenge? What do you mean by that? Well, because you're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with a very hostile situation for the most part between the families. Who's trying to get custody of the kid? Who's out for their best interest? Who is not? And, uh, and then it's, you know, it's compounded in the legal system and guess who's in the middle, the kids. Yeah. And so I usually try to focus on the bad parents that should not have custody of the kids. What if the bad parent contacts you to be their private investigator? Well, you have to sort through that. You have to look at it. Um, and generally most people that are represented by lawyers um, I contact the lawyer. Hmm. We just don't arbitrarily just do cases. So anybody that says, Hey, I'm, an, I'm, I'm represented. I can't, it, and it's, it's ethically the right way to do it. Sure. You just don't arbitrarily go on your own. And, and, and there's a concept there too. It's a team concept that you want to work together. Um, so every individual that has those type of behaviors, even on a criminal defense side, you know, I have guys in prison that call me and, and they're representing themselves, uh, pro se as it's called. I don't work with them. Uh, I work with the lawyers. So, um, and are there innocent people in prison? Yeah, there probably are some. I won't, I won't say there's a lot, but there are some. Mm -hmm. And have people been falsely accused of crimes? Absolutely. I've seen it a lot in the he, she said cases, especially on the college campuses. Um, and so, you know, I have to look, you have to look and take a different perspective. You know, on the one hand, I was on that side of the fence, so to speak. On the other hand, I'm on this side of the fence, so to, so to speak. But the reality is you're looking for justice in the sense that this person is being falsely accused of a crime. And then you have to look into that accusation. And so that's how we work with the lawyers in those cases. Okay. And would you say most people in the world who are involved in violent crime are psychopathic, sociopathic, narcissists, or are most people pretty good people? They just have terrible circumstances that they've run into. Well, there's different types of cases uh, in terms of homicide. One is called the heat of passion, where let's say a husband catches his wife with her lover and he decides to kill the lover and or the wife or both. That's a little different than the guy um, who's an informant for DEA or the police and goes and gets killed. Those killers have no conscience. The individual that committed the crime, what we call the heat of passion, is different. Um, the killer side you'll never be able to rehabilitate, ever. Maybe on a domestic side, there's a possibility of rehabbing that person because it was a spontaneous event. That, Not that there's any justification for killing anybody. Right. It's a lot different than somebody who does it for a living and goes around killing people. Right. So if we're looking ahead to the future, to have a thriving human race. What is your advice for individuals and the system of the United States? That's a difficult question. It is. <laughs> um, I, I would say, um, in, in my view, faith would be number one. Um, that to me is, is the strongest uh, that we can go to. I think faith has a lot to do with it. Um, I think what we've seen that's happened in our society um, 
is the lack of faith that's happened in our schools. You don't say prayers anymore. You don't pledge allegiance anymore. Those are all breakdowns. So when you look back from when I grew up, back in the 50s and 60s, in an ethnic neighborhood, we had our morals there developed not only by our family, but by our neighborhood, because the people all looked out for each other. So nowadays, it's, it's a totally different ballgame. Uh, again, I think faith, family, still the old adage, I think those are the right track to uh, helping uh, humanity through difficult times. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here because what an important conversation this has been and needs to continue being talked about for sure. But thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.